Our next presentation is titled, Frequent Users of the Emergency Department in a Universal Health Coverage System, a Randomized Control Trial of a Case Management Intervention. And I'm pleased to invite the first author, Patrick Bodenmann, to present. So thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a real privilege to be here today to share with you some of the results of our study, my acknowledgments to the co-authors and to each one of the patients, our frequent users. In terms of background, first, who are the frequent users of the ED? Based on recent systematic review of the literature, we know there is no consensus about the definition between two to 12 visits per year. No gender difference, they are mainly young patients, and even though they represent a small percentage of patients, they generate a lot of ED visits. Secondly, how can we help these patients? As you can see on this table, two of the four RCTs performed prior to our study support the case management approach for three outcomes of interest, with a decrease of ED use and the related costs, and of some problematic social issues, for example, housing for homeless patients. The third key point is to understand the frequent user within the healthcare system. As you probably know, Switzerland has a very costly healthcare system where it's rare to be uninsured, less than 1% of the general population, with an insurance based on individually purchased plans from private insurers. The Swiss frequent users still represent an important amount of visits with the combined contribution of social and medical difficult situation as predictive factors of high ED use. The primary aim was to make an accurate evaluation of just how effective an, an interdisciplinary case management intervention is when compared to standard emergency care, whether in fact it has reduced the department attendance through redirection of the care to more adapted services. The secondary aims were to examine the impact on the frequent user's quality of life from the patient's perspective and its impact on the cost for the hospital and the overall healthcare system. I will not describe the cost results due to time limit, but we had net neutral findings which were presented on Wednesday on a poster. I will underline the most important results concerning the quality of life issue. In terms of methodology, an automated 24 hour seven days a week detection system based on ED patient tracking software identified all adult patients who attended the ED five times or more during the previous 12 months. We recruited the participants between May 2012 and July 2013. The participants were randomly allocated either to the control or to the intervention group. There was no blinding for patients and health caregivers. Participants in the intervention group, in addition to usual care, received the case management intervention at one, three, and five month intervals, either in the hospital, in the ambulatory care, or at home. Although the control group only received standard care, and this is an important point, they did see, like the intervention group, a researcher on a regular basis during the 12 month period follow up at two, 5.5, nine and 12 months, asking them about the quality of life. Finally, the number of ED visits by study participants was monitored during the 12 months of study follow-up, that was the period two, and compared to the number of visits during period one. After doing descriptive statistics because of a non-normal distribution, we used the generalized linear mixed FX models for count data for the quality of life evaluation, we use the who call brief version, with, which include 26 questions and four dimensions, physical health, psychological health, social relationships, and environment. And all the analysis were done in an intention treated perspective. More concretely, the team formed by four, four nurse practitioners and a general internist, uh, in fact, the chief resident, in addition to standard care broad first, a counseling based on motivational interviewing and cross-cultural competencies 
addressing the social determinants of health and the use of medical services. Second, a concrete assistance in obtaining income entitlements, better health insurance coverage, stable housing, and, ed and educational opportunities for the children, but also for the adults with low health literacy. And third, referring to mental health department, substance abuse services, or a new GP or provider. All of this was done with an emphasis on care coordination and orchestration with the other health actors by the team. Results. Among the 1,145 frequent users, we couldn't interview 270 of them because at some period of important influx, we did not have enough staff to make the contact with all the frequent users. As you can see, 231 were not eligible because of exclusion criteria, for example, unable to consent, prior can case management, and so on. 171 were unreachable, because they were identified but not evaluated in the ED, and they didn't respond when we called within 72 hours. And finally, 276 refused for different reasons, like no feeling of benefit, not satisfied with the hospital, or a recent participation in another study. So we can say that this flowchart underlines the challenge of enrolling this type of patients in a clinical trial. Finally, at the end of the follow-up, we had data on the primary outcome for 230 surviving patients. Unfortunately, 20 died, 10 in each group, and quality of life information for 77 and 79 percent of the patients. The message of the baseline characteristic table is quite simple. There was no difference between the two groups except for the education. As you can see, the majority of our patients were foreign, young male. A significant proportion of them received social benefits, and a very low percent was uninsured. Only 13% did not have a GP. They presented a significant burden of somatic and mental health problems, at risk behaviors, and social difficulties. And finally, there was a significant difference between the groups with lower levels of educational attainment among the intervention group. This is an important slide with the outcomes results. First, the ED visits. At intake, both groups were comparable with a medium of five visits during the 12 months prior to study enrollment. At the end of the 12 months follow-up, you can see on the diagram on the x-axis, you have the two groups. On the y-axis, you have the difference of the number of visits at the end of the follow-up. Both went down. The median decrease in the control group was three, minus three consultation, whereas the median decrease on the intervention group was four, a statistically significant difference. For the control group, it's important to keep in mind that if they only receive standard care, they had regular contact with a member of the research team during the 12-month period. This contact allowed the frequent user to ask questions and to be listened to on a regular basis. Another possibility is that during the follow-up period, there was probably a regression to the mean, which is well described in the literature, but this regression should be present in the intervention group also. For the intervention group, there was a statistically significant but also clinically interesting effect because an additional reduction of one visit translates for us into 15 to 20 percent less work by the ED. Remember that participants in both groups had a median of five visits at intake. Concerning the quality of life outcome, there was an improvement of quality of life for the four dimensions on both groups but it was statistically significant concerning the environmental dimension for the intervention group. This environmental dimension is composed of items such as feeling of security, financial resources, and access to health care, and as we saw, there were important objectives of our intervention. So we can say less ED visits and better quality of life specifically for the environmental dimension in the intervention group. We were evaluating how effective our case management intervention was when compared to standard care through a reorientation to other services in the ED within the hospital or at the community level. 
As you can see, we oriented, for example, to mental health services, 57% of the intervention group's patients, 30% of them to substance abuse services, and so on. More than 80% of the patients reported to have a GP at baseline. Therefore, it's of major importance to include and connect every health actors, particularly the GP, on the ongoing care of the frequent users. There were undeniable obstacles in this pragmatic randomized control trial. Some were challenges as the frequent user characteristics and the mortality rate. The 12 month follow up was a challenge because to follow that type of patients was difficult as well as a limitation because of the potential regression to the mean during this period. And among the limitations, a low response rate and a single site. In conclusion, our intervention reduces the ED visit through an effort to reorient the frequent user through the healthcare system while simultaneously improving the, their environmental quality of life. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be glad to answer some of your questions concerning these for us very exciting and very eye-opening research. Thank you.